Are we ready? I think we're ready. All right, everyone. It is spring of 2021. We're all still here. We had a full year of school, and we're here to do the Spring Honors Symposium. Do you need me to talk into the microphone? I don't need a microphone. I'm loud on my own. All right, so welcome to the Spring 2021 Honors Symposium. It's pretty exciting we made it, so I'm awfully happy to be here. We have three groups who will be presenting tonight. And just a little bit of background on our Honors Symposium. We came up with the idea of doing honors classes Back in 2011, we did a strategic plan, and we wanted to put together some courses for students who are higher performers. And we came up with adding the honors component to some of the classes that we have here on campus. And so that's what we decided to do, and we held our first honors symposium in 2012. So we are at the nine-year mark of holding an honors symposium each semester. So uh, the students who participate in our symposium are students who come in here with either an ACT composite score of 22 or higher, or come in with a 3.25 GPA, and it's required for you to hold that all throughout college in order to participate in these classes. So each semester, we have uh, students who will put together presentations for us. And this semester, if you take a look in the program, you can see I need to thank our honors instructors, those who have held honors courses for us. So if you take a look, Abnormal Psych with Dr. KG, General Biology 2 with Janelle Green, Anatomy and Physiology 2 with Dr. Data, Ele Elementary Statistics with Tracy Chisholm, General Chemistry too with Angie Bartholomew, Intro to Children's Literature with Dr. Gary Albrightson, and U.S. History since 1877 with Dr. Zara Moss. Thank you to all of you who host honors classes. We definitely appreciate it. And so we're going to kick things off tonight. I'll introduce uh, to you the uh, lead, the fearless leader of our Anatomy and Physiology two group, Dr. Data, if you want to introduce your group. Eventually, we, um, we made it work, and our experiments were successful, and again, they did an excellent job. They were, <laughs> you're laughing sitting right here. <laughs> they were excellent in, uh, in communicating. They were highly um, um, focused on what they did, and eventually made, made that experiment work with their um, diligence. So thanks to them. And um, again, this honors um, symposium is an excellent opportunity for these kids who are um, obviously focused in their, in their studies, in their game, and it really gives them that platform from where they can, uh, they can launch high and far. So that's all I have to say. With that, I'll hand it over to Gisela and Chloe. Or is it back to Carrie? No. Okay. They are going to present to you um, some transformation of bacteria using a plasma. So take it away. Thank you. Um, good evening, and before we get started, we just want to say thank you for all for attending and for filming so our families can watch back home. I know my family can't be here today, so thank you for that. So our presentation is on 
um, the transformation of E. coli using green fluorescent protein plasmid, and a little bit You said it at the wrong time, Siobhan. <laughs> you said it way in the middle of the presentation. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> so this is what our presentation is on. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so a little background information. When Earth formed, it wasn't long until bacteria appeared on, on Earth. Keep in mind that when Earth formed, that was around four to six billion years ago. It is believed that bacteria is the first life to ever appear on Earth. So what is bacteria? Bacteria are single-celled microbes. The cell structure is simpler than that of other organisms as there is no nucleus or membrane-bound organelles, which are referred to as prokaryotic microorganisms. Bacteria's control center containing the genetic information is contained in a single loop of DNA. Some bacteria have an extra circle of genetic material called plasmid. Plasmid is what we use in our lab of transferring E. coli. The plasmid often contains genes that give the bacterium some advantage over other bacteria, such as it may contain a gene that makes bacterium resistant to certain antibiotics. Bacteria may acquire plasmids through natural processes like transformation, transduction, and conjugation, which you'll get to in the next slide. Okay. So transformation is a process we use in our lab, and basically what it is, is the uptake and expression of foreign DNA by a living cell. You can see in the very top, there's two ways that a transformation process can go through. The first way is with DNA fragments. So bacteria takes in the DNA fragments and the bacteria chromosome will accept the fragments creating a stable transformation or a decline, the fragments resulting in an unsuccessful transformation. The second way is with a DNA plasmid. The DNA plasmid enters the bacteria creating the uptake of plasmid resulting in a stable transformation. Secondly, we have transduction which is the process by which foreign DNA is introduced into a cell by a virus or a viral vector. This process happens when the virus-infected bacteria move short pieces of chromosomal DNA from one bacterium to another by accident. You can see in the bottom picture here, you can see a viral vector entering the bacteria and dividing the DNA into small pieces to create more chromosomal DNA with pieces of the viral vector involved. The chromosomal DNA and viral vector is then entered into new bacteria, creating a, su a successful transduction. And lastly, we have conjugation, which is the very far photo here. Conjugation is a process in which bacterium transfers genetic material through direct contact. Here we have two different bacteria, one containing a plasmid while the other does not. From here, there's a pillus formed to combine the two bacteria together and create a pathway for the plasmid to regrow into the other bacteria, resulting in the bacteria containing plasmid. So you can see at the end, both of them are containing a plasmid. So why E. coli? We use E. coli because it is presently the best understood organism and it is a paradigm organism in bacteria physiology and genetics, as well as a key tool in molecular genetics. A paradigm organism is a distinct set of concepts or thought patterns, including theories, research, methods, and standards for what constitutes legitimate contributions to a field. E. coli is a preferred host for protein production due to its rapid growth and the ability to express proteins at very high levels. E. coli is also a preferred host for gene cloning due to the high efficiency of introduction of DNA molecules into a cell. And lastly, E. coli is a preferred host for the study of phage biology due to the detailed knowledge in, of its nucleic acid and protein biosynthetic pathways. And lastly, before we get into the topic of our lab, we have antibiotic resistance. 
So as antibiotic resistance bacteria die, they release their DNA fragments into the environment. Other non-resistant bacteria may acquire resistance by virtue of incorporating the resistant gene into its genome through transformation. With that being said, I'll pass the rest of the presentation over to my partner, Gisela, who will explain our lab. Okay, so our lab was called Transformation of E. coli using green fluorescent protein, otherwise known as GFP gene. Our objectives for this project was to understand the process of transformation that was mentioned before and to perform transformation of E. coli using that GFP gene. Okay, so for our project, we started with a Luria agar plate and prepared it by streaking DH5-alpha E. coli, which is a strain of E. coli, which is safe for lab purposes. After streaking the plates, we incubated the plates for about 48 hours in an incubator for 37, at 37 degrees Celsius. After 48 hours, we collected bacteria from a starter palette and transferred it to a calcium chloride sol uh, solution. We shocked the tubes um, by altering, alternating cold and warm temperatures. Um, doing so, we placed the tubes in ice cold water, which you can see on the very far picture, which reached near zero degrees. And then using our hands, we shocked the temperatures back up to 98 degrees. Plasmids containing uh, green fluorescent protein genes and an uh, amp ampicillin-resistant gene was then introduced into the calcium chloride and the DH5-alpha solution. An aliquot of the solution was taken and then poured into our plates and then incubated for yet another 48 hours. As mentioned before, we use the transformation process. For this portion of our process, our DNA and plasmids were already in, a, in the same environment and had already attached to a recipient cell. As the process continued, the recipient cell will rep replicate and then produce offspring with traits. After another 48 hours, as a result, our plates um, had bacteria expressing green fluorescent bacteria. In the picture, you can see this one right here. Um, the control had no green fluorescent bacterial growth, and while the other two had shown large glowing colonies of the bacteria. The significance of bacterial transformation was to create a recombined bacteria that produced both desired proteins and traits in the offspring. The process we used is seen when working with mass productions of drugs or pr proteins such as insulin. Those are our references. Um, we would also like to acknowledge DCB, of course, for hosting the Honor Symposium, and also the faculty and staff that helped with all of the other classes and all of the other projects that are presenting tonight. And we would also like to acknowledge Shubham Dada for helping us throughout this project and making this worthwhile. Are there any questions about our presentation? Thank you again and good luck to everyone else who's presenting tonight. All right, our next group is going to be the group who are presenting on behalf of the General Chemistry II class. So I will turn it over to Angie Bartholomew to introduce our student presenters. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Uh, this spring, um, as every spring in Chem II, we talk about environmental chemistry as one of our topics. 
And we were talking about impacts of different chemicals on living organisms. And in particular, we, the conversation came up of the calcium levels in chicken eggs or different bird eggs um, with different pesticides and herbicides uh, being applied. So that's where our project got a start. Um, the honor students, they thought it would be fun to measure those calcium levels and they did lots and lots of titrating. They're expert titraters after this point and this is a very good technique for anybody that wants to go into um, a chemistry related field. So I'll introduce um, these young ladies. Uh, first is Sarah Fry. She is a graduate of Newburgh High School and comes to us here at DCB um, and will leave us here at DCB in a year. <laughs> um, on to bigger and better things, she plans to go into um, science or math education at MSU in the fall. So she'll graduate this spring. Uh, Courtney Herman uh, from Lampert, Montana. She uh, plans to return to DCP in the fall. Um, we've enjoyed having her watch her in sports and having her in class. Um, and she is completing the requirements to get into uh, veterinary sciences, uh, become a vet in the vet program. And Amy Lewis from Burden, Manitoba. She, we also have enjoyed watching her on the volleyball courts. She will too return uh, to DCB in the fall and further her preparation for pharmacy school. So I'll turn it over to these young ladies to talk to you about calcium levels in eggs. I'd just like to thank um, Angie for everything in this class. We want to thank DCB for holding this symposium and everyone showing up tonight. Um, our project is called Exciting News, How Much Calcium is in Your Eggshells? So to start off with, we have our hypothesis. Um, our hypothesis for this experiment was that upon finding the percent calcium carbonate, in eggshells of different kinds of chicken, we'd see consistent differences among like the numbers from chicken to chicken due to their lifestyles and their diet. For example, we wanted to compare free range chickens versus cage and egg laying chickens. We will be using a titration to collect our data and confirm whether our hypothesis is correct or not. Okay, so why are we doing this? Um, we have found out it is important to know the levels of calcium in the eggshells because with the more calcium, the harder the eggshells will actually be. It is good for them to be at a higher level so they do not easily break when their mother sits on them if they are fertilized. But they should also not be too hard so they have a chance of surviving hatching. Um, what is in my eggshells? Um, so eggshells are created with a combination of calcium derived from the longer bones, like the femur of the chicken, and carbonate from carbon dioxide in respiration and breathing of the chicken. These substances are carried in the blood of a chicken to the gland that forms the shell by calcification, and this is called the shell gland. The calcium from the long bones is replenished by food in the diet of the chicken. Around the egg is this very, very thin membrane and it is evenly spaced on the membrane are points. There's calcite, which is the form of calcium carbonate in these eggshells. And these are made in columns. They stack side by side to form the shell. And this gives the eggshell its hardness and strength that Courtney was talking about to protect what's inside. A good quality eggshell will contain on average 2.2 grams of calcium in the form of calcium carbonate and that would equal a 94% calcium carbonate. So what even is a titration? Well, titration is a way of finding out the concentration of a dissolved substance. 
To do this, first step, you have to add an acid to your dissolved substance. In our case, it was the eggshells. And you have to make sure that the reaction is complete because in that reaction, some of the acid will be used up and that will help us in determining the concentration later. Once our reaction is complete, then we have to add an indicator. We have to make sure that the indicator will show us when our solution is neutral. So we have to pick one that will change color when the solution is at a pH of seven. After the indicator is added, then we start to slowly add our base. Once the solution changes color, we know that it is neutral and our reaction is complete. So how did we do this? Well, for starters, we had to, you can see in this picture here, we had to remove the, that thin membrane from the inside of the eggshell, which was not fun. That was very difficult. Um, and if the reason we had to remove it is because if it was in there, it would give us some unwanted additions to our reaction. You can see in this picture here, there was a precipitate because we did not get all of the membrane out of it. Um, so after we did that, we would crush them up, as you see on the picture over there, with a mortar and pestle. And then after that, we were able to add our acid. So on this first picture over here, we, we can see where, which indicator we used because it would turn purple at a pH of seven. And then these other two pictures show the indicator before we added the, ba the base, and then once it turned purple when the solution was neutral. So after, after we were done, after it changed color, we were able to record the volume of our base and using that data, we were able to determine the amount of calcium carbonate in the eggshell. Okay, so our calculations for this. Um, the 16 milliliters you can see up here is actually the amount of HCl that reacted with the eggshells. Here we times it by one mole divided by 1,000 milliliters to convert it into moles, which is easier to work with. And then we took those moles and times it by the mole ratio in our balanced equation to get it to convert it to moles of calcium carbonate instead of HCl. We took these moles and then times it by its molar mass divided by one mole to get it into grams. And once we got our grams of calcium carbonate, we could then calculate the actual percentage that is in our eggs. As you can see here, this was our control egg. It is a Walmart egg and we figured they would be a good egg to base our other eggs off of, you could say. Here you can see we did two trials. In the first trial, we added the acid and we did our titration right away. But in our second trial, we actually switched up our procedure and left the eggshells to dissolve over the weekend in hopes of a better, um, hopefully get a better percentage. And here you can see we have an outlier egg. We actually had to do three trials because we had such a significant difference in our percentages. And here you can see our other eggs that are around the same as our control. Here we could only do one trial because we did not have enough of the one eggshell we were working with. Here we had one, they were the same. Another one that didn't differentiate too much. Another one, and yep, okay. So if you are struggling as a producer to keep the levels of your calcium carbonate up in your eggs, there are methods to raise those.
First, you can either feed your chicken a limestone or oyster, like a ground oyster shell supplement, and you can add this into their food. This should help boost those levels, but they can also benefit from a vitamin powder added into their water once every other day in the week. But there is a budget-friendly option if you do not want to purchase these others. You can actually recycle old eggshells and clean them up and then grind them into unrecognizable pieces and also add these into their food. It is important for them to be unrecognizable or the chickens could be triggered to actually eat their own eggs. Um, so to conclude, our hypothesis was actually disapproved. We originally made a hypothesis stating that eggshells from eggs laid by cage layers would have different calcium carbonate levels than those laid by free-range chickens due to lifestyle and diet differences. We've since come to conclude that this hypothesis was in fact not true and that there was no consistent correlation between the kind of chicken and the percent of calcium carbonate in their egg shell. We also came to see that our eggs aren't of the highest, highest quality because none of them reached the optimal 94% of calcium carbonate in their eggshell. We also want to recognize that there was some human and experimental error that occurred during our project. Um, for example, our precipitate showing up because of not getting all of the membrane off the egg and switching up our procedure within the middle of the experiment. Um, at this point, we would like to open it up for questions. Yeah, a few of the chickens actually came from my aunt's farm. Um, one of Bart's friends actually provided a couple eggs, and then, of course, our control came from Walmart. So. Any further questions? Seeing as there is none, thank you for watching our presentation. All right, our next group comes out of biology 151, and that is general biology too. And their instructor is Janelle Green. So I'll let Janelle come up and introduce the final presentation of the night. Thank you, Carrie. Um, this is actually the first year that I have been an instructor for an honors group, so we'll see how this goes. Um, no, it should be fine. Uh, but general biology, too, is highly uh, evolutionary and zoologically based, and so um, they are going to be talking about natural selection, and if you know what natural selection is, it is... Uh, an organism's ability to adapt and thrive in changing environmental conditions, and uh, brine shrimp are a good example of that. So you will find out why within their presentation. Um, and they also had some challenges between uh, concussions and uh, some counting of items and microscope use and all of the above. Um, so it was interesting, but um, they did a good job. So Connor Beck. Courtney Herman, you guys can take it away. So as Ms. Green said, we will be touching the subject of natural selection using brine shrimp. The purpose of this experiment was to test the effects of concentration and how this would affect their hatching viability. Um, we would also relate the salt tolerance to this as well. Um, this would be touching like the ideal versus poor conditions. And why are we using these brain shrimp? They are easy to observe and they have a unique adaptation. Okay, so a little background. 
Um, Ms. Green touched slightly on what natural selection is, but it is the process by which some individuals thrive better in their environment than others and have greater reproductive success. This success allows their genetics to be passed on while others with less success will eventually die off. And because of their unique adaptation, it is they have been able to pass their genetics on. All right. So we'll talk about like what are brine shrimp? They're the microorganism. They're in the crustaceans. Um, they inhabit salty waters around the world. Um, males, they grow on average about 0.3 to 0.4 inches long. And then females growing about 0.4 to 0.5. And then they're adapted to more harsher conditions. It makes it better for this test. Okay, so here we will discuss the different stages of the brine shrimp. We actually did not get to see them into their full adult stages. We only worked with them from their dormant cysts until they were in their mouthmere stages. Um, we tried to grow them into adults, but I don't think we were very successful in that as we didn't see any. Okay. To talk about their brine shrimp adaptation, um, they actually have this special feature. Their eggs, if it is not in an ideal condition, there will be a hard shell that will form around them known as a chorion. And if they are in a situation where they will not be able to survive and be as successful as they can, that allows them to stay in their egg until the conditions are ideal. Um, Poor environmental conditions could be those of like it's too salty or not enough salt or perhaps they were in oxygen and not in water. That's how we received our cyst. They were actually in an oxygen type container. Okay, so our hypothesis for this is that we predicted that brine shrimp will have a greater hatching viability in the higher concentrations of salt. And we believe this is so because they live in brine pools within the ocean. Okay, so for our procedure, uh, we had to make the concentrations of our salt that you can see here. And then we had to take our eggs and we had to count out about 20 of them and keep in mind that they were maybe like a pencil dot. So we actually had to use the tip of a paintbrush and we put them on a double-sided sticky tape and then we attached this to a slide, which then we had to proceed to count how many were actually on that slide. And I think that's where a little bit of our human error came in because our main counter was a little concussed at the time. <laughs> so, I so, tried. So 20 eggs turned out to be around 40 or 50. <laughs> so when day two, we would leave this over 24, 24 hours and we'd come back the next day and we would examine our petri dishes. Here, we would count how many brine shrimp actually hatched and were swimming around at this time. And then we would move those to a separate container, which we were gonna try to grow into adults. And then we would also count the number that were like dead or partially hatched. For those, we would leave for another 24 hours and we'd do the same process for day three. Okay, here you can see like actually what we were working with. Here would be an example of a swimmer that we would have to count and here you can see, like partially hatched, it is still hanging on to the egg. Same here and there. Here we have another swimmer. And then of course the darker circle would be known as the dormant cyst. And here we have another example of the swimmer. So
So at our data table, it doesn't go with what we were supposed to. So for like the first dish and the third dish, they were, and there was a very low hatching visibility. And then for the two, for the two, four and five, they were a little higher with two and four being the highest ones. And then how we calculated the hatchings. We took the amount of swimmers from 24 hours and added them with the 20, or with the 48 hours. And then we ended up dividing those by the initial eggs that we had, which were a lot. And yeah. So our conclusion for this is our hypothesis was actually disproved we thought there would be a higher hatching viability in the higher concentrations of salt, but they actually preferred the 1% over all. That was our highest. Um, so I guess we had two that were the highest, but neither of them were the greatest concentration. And again, we always like to point out there are always possible errors such as miscounting, because keep in mind, the swimmers are actually moving around. So there is a possibility that we could have counted them twice because they ended up in a different location. Um, again, <laughs> Cuban uh, injuries, such as our concussion and counting. <laughs> um, something that we can also take in to the fact is that the age of these cysts that we received, we don't know how long they have actually been in that cyst form. And then again, we only had one trial, and I think our data could have been improved with a possibility of more trials. Yeah. That is the end. So we'd like to open this up to questions. Okay, so um, that is something we actually did not compare. Um, we, the ocean is around 3% salt, I believe, so that's why we thought they would like the higher concentrations, but yeah. further questions? If not, thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your presentations. They were excellent, and thanks for taking this opportunity to participate in the honors courses and to present your findings. This is good experience for you. Uh, to wrap things up, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Migler for our closing remarks. Thanks very much. And congratulations. Job well done to all of you that uh, made presentations tonight. Um, you got to tackle subjects that our best to stay with you because uh, that was some, uh, some pretty significant uh, information you were sharing with us. Uh, you thought you were done, but you're not. I have a quick, I have a question for you because uh, I'll put it in context a little bit. Uh, part of the honors program is learning how to learn. And I don't know, you know, you probably approach it from the standpoint that I'm going to have a topic and I'm going to uh, uh, do some research What did you learn along the way? Because in a higher education institution, whether it's DCB or wherever else that you're planning on transferring, one of our goals is to help you learn how to learn, to learn how to think, how to, how to evaluate and make critical decisions. And so, some of you actually touched on it. You didn't uh, 
uh, in terms of how things went with the experiments and the research project. But what did you learn outside of the actual subject that you picked? That's the hard question for you right now. And I'll tell you, I'm not going to move on until somebody gives me an answer. To it. <laughs> what did you learn of besides? What did you learn besides the subject uh, and the experiment? Pardon? We have to work together. Have to work together. And you all pointed out examples of how, how you did that. And in life you're gonna you're gonna run into that. In some cases it works well, some cases uh, not so well, and you probably have already experienced that. But it looked like you had groups that and you had to learn how to pitch in and uh, maybe share the workload or share information. Probably wasn't in the syllabus, probably wasn't in the course description. Uh, so you learned how to work together. What else? Um, it's okay for things to go wrong. Yeah. You know what? That's kind of like real life. Mm -hmm. You know, and so things don't always go as planned. And I think that's one thing because a lot of times uh, I think we're, we're conditioned in, in education uh, uh, in, in our country, in Canada, and in Europe, pretty much the same way that somebody's going to open up my head and pour in the information, and that's what education is. And so this was, this was a little different, and so there, was, there were some of the lessons that, that, that came in, and things don't always go according to plan. Sometimes when we're in a classroom situation, it's kind of like this is what's going to happen, this is the way it's always going to be, and uh, you know, things are never going to go wrong. So you learn that. One more thing. What else did you learn? Patience. I yep. mean, we have our place and incubators, and after a few days, we looked at them, there's nothing. So we had to wait a few more days, and it came out perfectly fine after. Yeah. But we really had to wait and trust the process. Yeah. And none of that was probably written down. You probably said, I'm not going to learn patience when I sign up. I'm not, I'm not planning to learn patience when I take this course. And my point is, on all of this, this is part of the learning process. Uh, and I'd also like you to step back and think, uh, touch on a little bit, you're learning, you're learning a different way. Uh, you kind of taught yourselves. Your instructors helped, I, I know that. But a lot of this, I think you had to step in and you had to chart your course, you had to pick the subjects uh, and kind of plan how you were going to do that. You, in, in some ways, we're teaching you how to, to, to learn, but how to be your own teacher. And those are really good lessons in life, and that's, that's, that's part of sometimes the thing we don't think about uh, in higher education, or you may not think about as a student. So I want to congratulate you uh, for being able to do that. Uh, I'm also guessing that one of the things that you, are learned, that you learned was how to make good decisions. What data is good, what data are not so good, uh, what's real, what's not real. And that is, that's a skill these days that is, is really critical because a lot of people are taking the shortcuts and they're thinking that I don't need to do that. All my encyclopedia is Facebook or, or YouTube. And uh, we really need people that are able to make critical judgments like you were learning here. So these are all really good skills, things that you probably would never thought about when you signed up for the honors course. I can tell you on behalf of all of us at DCV, uh, we're proud of you. We're proud of you for taking that extra step um, and, and uh, putting yourself in a position to, to challenge yourselves. It's a really good skill. Uh, you may not think so much about it now, but those are skills that are going to really help you as you move through uh, the next stage, the next chapter in your life, the next uh, college that you go to. So uh, I want to thank Terry for taking the lead and keeping, keeping our honors program uh, moving for all of you as faculty that have uh, taught this semester or in the past. Uh, it's really a combination of uh, uh, a team effort that makes all of this happen. So uh, knowing that the semester is drawing to a close, I know that you uh, have a lot of things. It's going to be a busy couple of weeks. Uh, I'll just wrap it up by saying great job.
go. Have a great night.